Hey, I'm Brennan from Plug BC, and you're watching the Go Electric Fleet Show. Today I'm joined by Sukdeep Gill, director at Cielo EV Charging Systems. And we're here at Coast Mountain Bus Company's Hamilton Transit Yard to learn more about their bus fleet electrification project. Welcome to the Go Electric Fleet Show. This is where we sit down and chat about EV fleets, infrastructure, and more. Join us as we explore EV fleets here in BC. Hi, I'm Dave Sove. I'm the director of the Low Carbon Fleet Programs at Coast Mountain Bus Company. My role is to lead the decarbonization efforts of CNBC's bus fleet towards zero emission targets set by TransLink Sustainability. Within the TransLink enterprise, we have a target to be net zero by 2050. And of that target, CNBC's bus fleet emissions account for 89%. To meet 2050, we have two interim goals that apply to us. First being the 2030 target for 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And the second being zero emissions from our revenue bus fleet by 2040. The second target, 2040, represents a substantial change to our bus fleet in its composition. CNBC's bus fleet is quite diverse. We serve a, a, a wide community in the Lower Mainland, and we have a number of different fleet types and service types. So we have our standard 40-foot buses, we have our 60-foot buses, we have our double-deckers, we have our highway coaches, we have our community shuttles, we have our paratransit. Each of those routes and blocks and service types and vehicle types is unique and it has unique needs in terms of its energy requirements and how it will transition to be zero emission. I'm just curious on the planning process. So for example, like I, when these projects come at play, it's one of the conversations is like, right away is like, where are we gonna put everything? Right. Right, so I think like, what was that process like and in comparison to from the planning to what the deliverables were on what what is existing at present. So in terms of place and equipment, that's that's certainly a question. I, I mentioned off the top that um, we have depots at capacity. We've we've filled these with as many buses as we can, and we provide as much transit service to the Lower Mainland as we absolutely can. So we don't want to we don't want to pull back on that. So uh, what you see down the track here is. We had existing light poles in here, mm -hmm. and we were able to put in 26 dispensers uh, without adjusting any of the tracks. Interestingly enough, we we're engaged in a project at Port Coquitlam Transit Center as well, and we we're electrifying tracks there as well. And, and that was a little more challenging. We were doing 121 dispensers there versus the 26 that you see here. And in order to kind of maintain the, the number of parking spaces, uh, we, we had to restripe uh, the yard. Um, and we were able to do that and, and, and still fit uh, the same number of buses in and, and the electrical infrastructure required for our zero emission buses. Some routes can be served by you know, charging in the depot like you see at HTC, we have, we have depot chargers here. Uh, so these buses would charge overnight or charge when they're back in the yard. But we also have chargers that are required out in the community, so at our bus loops or on-road chargers. So we have two at 22nd Street right now, and we have one at Marple Loop. Uh, we have 10 under construction for Port Lacombe Transit Center's project. I also see that you've implemented cable management, so I would imagine that's, that's keeping the cables tucked away and and out of the way when they're when the drivers are pulling in. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that we, we've learned uh, throughout um, you know, understanding through our pilot programs or, or through our travels to uh, and conversations with other transit agencies is, you know, what do you do with this cable? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've got a solution here for, for Hamilton Transit Center that, that mostly keeps those cables off the ground, uh, away from being abraded and keeps them safe. Uh, that, that's been a, a helpful thing that we've implemented here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the operation side, like from a driver perspective, yeah. like how, how difficult it is or is it just plug and play now um, any support that they do have or training that they require so on the training side of things um, we have training programs developed uh, for drivers that operate electric vehicles there's also some additional pieces on charging on road mm -hmm. uh, where there's a charge enable switch that allows you to connect to the pantograph a charger that you see at 22nd street or mark wall Amazing. In terms of like the power that these vehicles are getting, it, are you able to touch base on that? And also even, is there particular windows of the day that you charge versus don't charge? And it, it, would there be any benefit to delaying charging um, yeah, over the course of the day? That's a great question. Um, so in terms of charger power, uh, we have seven charger cabinets connected to 26 different dispensers. So roughly that's four dispensers per 
um, charger, mm -hmm. and that's a 150 kilowatt total that gets divided across the vehicles that are connected to it. Um, in terms of time of day charging, we do have a charge management system. There are advantages to charging overnight for overnight rates. Um, that becomes critically important when you scale these projects uh, to keep the overall capacity needs for the facility down. We're not at that scale with, with 26 dispensers, um, but as this scales up, we, we'd certainly have models to, to show and to forecast the need to manage our charging and, and time, of, time of use charging. Yeah, I think it's, it's really neat the way you're not actually taking up any more space along the, where the dispensers are to, in comparison to the, even the power cabinets. The, mm -hmm. the footprint is, is remaining intact. So that's one of, like, one of the biggest things is right away that everyone's concerned with how much space they'll potentially lose or they have to rejig. So I, I'm, I really like how you're utilizing where the lighting poles were and, and it's just, it, it seems as if it was always there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks for acknowledging that. I think our design teams and construction teams work really hard to be able to package this mm -hmm. the way they have and to ensure that we are you know, able to provide as much transit service as possible to the lower mainland. As things scale, we, we do have you know, bigger challenges, um, but uh, keeping that, that mindset to ensure that we kind of minimize the packaging is certainly possible when you see mm -hmm. applications like done like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Our dispensers and our charge cabinets are provided by Siemens. Uh, they're 150 kilowatts and they're split across uh, either three or four dispensers. Uh, so each each cabinet um, will distribute their power amongst the amongst the different buses. Our buses are at Hamilton Transit Center are the LFSC Plus from Nova. Uh, that's a Quebec manufacturer. Uh, their battery pack is 374 kilowatt hours and it takes a charge uh, from these cabinets of up to 150 kilowatts. Uh, depending on how it comes back, uh, it'll be somewhere between four and, and six hours to charge it. The other way you can charge the vehicle is there's overhead pantograph rails, overhead rails, and that allows these buses to charge when they're en route. And so during layover times at either Marpole or 22nd Street, these vehicles can be taking a top up charge. Depending on how we structure those routes and blocks, they can come back with more energy than they left with. What, what has been the feedback uh, from the drivers in the sense of the operators um, of what their experience has been like? For the most part, it's been positive. Um, often we hear from operations that it's just a bus. Mm -hmm. um, the ride is smooth. The, it's typically quieter for both passengers on the bus, the driver, but also the community around them. At 22nd Street or, or Pantograph Charger, a bus will pull into the location where the charger is. They'll position the bus uh, based on marks, similar to what you see on the ground. And the bus will then begin communication with the charger. Um, the operator will flick the charge enable switch, saying that they're ready to have a charge. And the bus will then communicate via Wi-Fi to the charger and agree on terms of charging, and charging will commence, and then when it's ready to be finished charging, it will disengage the charging event and continue on its way. Make sure to subscribe to our channel for more updates on fleet electrification and other sustainable transportation solutions. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Go Electric Fleet Show.